let's throw him an introduction real quick. Um, Joe Nickel has done a bunch of stuff. He's been on the... If you, if you turn on the Discovery Channel or the History Channel about anything remotely paranormal or ghost-related, uh, flip a coin. That's the odds you'll see his face. Uh, he's been on there a ton. Um, his, he's a document investigator, uh, consultant, um, who has helped expose false, uh, false documents like the purported diaries of Jack the Ripper and Adolf Hitler. He's a senior research fellow for the Committee uh, for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. Uh, he's a member of the Executive Council for the Center for Inquiry. Uh, or is that, yeah. Writing re and he writes regularly for their journal, journal The Skeptical Inquirer, which you can pick up just out here. And as the flyer says, he's done a buttload of other very impressive scholarly things. Anyway. <laughs> Join me in giving a piratey and Bible belty welcome to Joe Nickel. Thank you very much. Someone just took my notes. JT, was that you? Did you just take my notes? No. You don't need They were lying right here. They're actually not notes, they're just images so that I know which picture's coming up next. No text. And so in keeping with the fact that there's no text, I'll just talk like this. <laughs> and you can just look at the pictures. I see that this audience will laugh at almost anything, so it'll be easy for, <clears throat> it'll be easy for me. Well, I'm, uh, I'm an investigator of the paranormal. I, uh, Maybe the only full-time professional paranormal investigator in the world, salaried. I don't know of another one. Uh, they say the secret to life is find something you like to do. You have to be able to do it fairly well to pull off the, the scheme and then find someone to pay you to do it. So I, I began, this, this year is my 40th anniversary as a paranormal investigator. And since 1995, you can do the math, I think that's like 14 years, I've been with the Center for Inquiry, who's given me a wonderful opportunity to pretty much travel around the world and look into things as I see fit, because if I don't know what needs doing, who's to tell me what to do? I mean, it's, uh, it's this very special field. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be with old friends like Vic Stinger and, and Robert Price and I want to talk to you today about what my approach is to the paranormal, and I, I use the word investigation a lot. Um, I am, as you know, I think, uh, a former magician, a former detective. I'm not supposed to use their name for publicity purposes, but a world-famous private investigative firm. Uh, did they go after the Jesse James gang? Did their name start with a P? I can't, I can't say. <clears throat> but I want to emphasize that word investigate because I think the paranormal, that most people tend to range into two camps. One group says, do you believe in ghosts? And the other group says, oh, I don't believe. And what I'm suggesting to you is that there's a sort of <clears throat> one approach is to begin with the desired answer or your gut instinct or what you think is sort of written in stone somewhere and work backwards to the evidence, picking and choosing that evidence which best fits what you believe. And I'm suggesting that we not do that, that we Look for evidence. This is hard to do. This means actually climbing down out of the ivory tower. Actually, actually going into a haunted house. People ask me, why would you bother to go into a haunted house when, you know, it's easy to just establish that there aren't any ghosts. You won't find any ghosts. So, as, as if I've wasted 40 years not knowing that. Hey, if I had just asked them, I could have saved 40 years. <clears throat> but in fact, that works if the question maybe is, are there ghosts or are there not? But I think that's not the question. I think the question is, do huge numbers of people believe in ghosts? And the answer is, obviously they do. So it behooves us, if we're to be credible, to explain those claims which appear to challenge science or to be 
uh, offering evidence for something that science is unaware of. And so that's what I do. I'm out there, I see my work as being on the very fringes of science, seeing if science has missed anything, and trying to <clears throat> run down these claims of alien abductions and psychic phenomena and crop circles and so forth, when yes, I know in many cases, very unlikely that I'm gonna find Bigfoot, but I wanna know why is it that oftentimes intelligent, sincere, honest, credible people are reporting, for example, a long-necked, multi-humped, serpentine creature in some of our lakes. And when skeptics go like this, or like this, <clears throat> I personally resent it because it is not fair to those people when they are not drunk and they are sincere and some of these people are highly competent and intelligent and they in fact have seen something that looks like I just described it and I'll get to that presently. So I'm suggesting that we not be debunkers or true believers, but investigators starting with the evidence, letting it lead to an answer, and believe that, like it or not. Okay? So let me see if this works. This is a magic wand, and it works by a magic invocation. It doesn't work, okay? <clears throat> I was afraid of this. Oh, a miracle occurred. <laughs> well, as you know, most talks begin, are thinly disguised commercials for the speaker's books, <clears throat> and uh, this talk will be no exception. I'm co-author of this book. I am not a scientist, but I do have a, a strong background in forensic science. I do historical document work. It shouldn't be that hard. Interesting. Hmm? Okay, maybe I just need to, okay. Where was I? Uh, okay, that's very distracting. So I have, a, um, <clears throat> I have a small laboratory at uh, Center for Inquiry, and I, I don't know what I'm doing here, maybe examining miracle rose petals or something. But when I need a real scientist, I go get one. Uh, we're a large organization with lots of scientists. Uh, here I am examining a weeping icon in uh, Toronto. Uh, this time, I was actually asked by the parent church of the Greek Orthodox Churches of North America. And uh, I was very happy to work with that church and for them. Or uh, we're trying to replicate some UFOs over Buffalo that um, our replication was so exact that it's almost certainly that they were simply balloons, perhaps released as is the custom uh, at a wedding. But they were drifting over and it seemed very puzzling until you began to analyze the tape and so forth. So I'm trying to, let me state this again, I'm trying to explain things, not just decide in a vacuum, of course there are no ghosts. Confident that if I can explain it, any needed debunking will take care of itself. Does that make sense? I hope it does. How do you walk on hot coals? Uh, fairly quickly, yes. Um, <laughs> the main thing I learned <clears throat> was when people ask you to stop so you can have your picture made, don't do it. Don't, don't do that. Don't stop. Keep, keep moving. 
I did this for uh, Discovery Channel and others, uh, showing how it's a simple matter to inflict stigmata on yourself. I don't know why people make such a big deal of it. Can you spot me in the crowd here? I'm, uh, this was on assignment for National Geographic's Is It Real? And I'm, um, I'm at the John of God service in Atlanta. He's the Brazilian healer who came to America in Atlanta. And he gets special messages from spirit entities, very psychic, special knowledge, and they help him heal people. Uh, you know, I don't think he was very psychic because uh, otherwise he should have known that, that the guy sitting back there with the uh, funny glasses and the cane uh, was, from his point of view, a, a fraud there to, there to catch him up. Uh, that's happened to me more than once, and uh, it delights me that I'm sitting next to a uh, psychic who's, supposed to, who's tell, giving me a reading and who, whose reading should be saying, um, I'm getting the name Nickel, and I'm getting really bad vibrations. <laughs> well, let me uh, take you to my very first important case. I guess as, really as early as 1969, I was interested in the paranormal. I sat in my first uh, seance to contact the spirit of Houdini. Now, he didn't really show up, but the spiritualist medium said he did. <laughs> this is the way it goes. Uh, DJ and I have each year, as you may know, on Halloween, we have a Houdini seance, and, and Houdini never shows, but, you know, we're not angry with him. Uh, we, we give him another chance each year, um, and we ask him to come and try to make it, make it nice for him. Well, my very first uh, significant case was the... McKinsey House Haunting, we're talking 1972 at McKinsey House in downtown Toronto, where for 10 years before I arrived, all sorts of ghostly shenanigans were going on in this house at 82 Bond Street. The phenomena included hearing McKinsey's printing press, old antique printing press, rumbling and clattering in the basement when no one was in the house, footsteps going up and down the staircase here when there was no one in the house, caretaker's wife waking up, seeing a man standing beside her bed, dressed in a period outfit. And this was, this was the case that really sold me on doing what I do. Now, whatever it was that people were hearing that they thought was the printing press, they were not hearing McKinsey's printing press. Rusted and locked in the basement. Here it is in more recent years, restored and in functioning but it didn't make a rumbling, clattering sound. What people were describing was a type of rotary press, a more modern press. And I found that next door to, well, let me just ask you, would you be interested in knowing that next door to McKinsey House was Macmillan Printing? <laughs> I did that with just a little bit of, not maliciousness, but mischief, because I just got you to jump to a conclusion, did I not? Nod your heads, yes. Because you said, oh well, they're hearing the printing presses next door. But I have to confess to you that I also jumped to that conclusion, that's why I knew you would. And that, in fact, there are no printing presses in that building. They're only, it's only a publishing company with offices and warehouse space. No, no presses in that building. However, there are late night cleanup crews in the basement using big iron wheeled carts loaded with empty metal garbage cans dragging across an iron concrete floor, rough concrete floor, rattling and clattering in a sound that would suggest a printing press if that's what you were so thinking. 
And what about the the caretaker? Let me go. Let me go back. Just just one more. Sorry. I'm looking at this at such an angle. Um, the sound of the footsteps, the staircase here, in this building, only 40 inches further away across this gap, is a parallel iron staircase. And of course, the cleanup crew I mentioned, also the caretakers of the building next door. And so people really were, they really were hearing footsteps on the stairs late at night when there was no one in the house. But because they were superstitious, their thought was that they were hearing footsteps on their staircase and that it was a ghost. So your orientation matters there. What about the waking up and seeing a ghostly figure? Well, here's a 19th century illustration of that, and it's a phenomenon called a waking dream. That is, we are usually, our body and mind are both asleep or both awake but sometimes they get out of sync. And so you can be sleepwalking in which your body's awake, but your mind is asleep, roughly. The opposite of that is that you're lying a bed and you wake up, you're aware that you're not dreaming, and you see strange things, like um, in the Middle Ages people saw demons, in the Victorian era, gray ladies' ghosts, and today you're apt to see depending on what you've read recently, um, little big-eyed, big-headed humanoids. This is a state of hallucination, and your body will often seem paralyzed because the body's still asleep, and it's interpreted differently. Like people who think they're seeing a demon are hallucinating that based on their assumption that a demon is holding them down, sitting on them, holding them down, explaining why they can't move. Or alien abduction, uh, people believe they're tied down and being experimented on because they can't move and they're hallucinating aliens. It's a common phenomenon and one of the most misunderstood, least understood phenomena that I know of. It's caused incredible amounts of mischief. Everybody knows about sleepwalking. Few people know about waking dreams, which are much more common because they think they're real experiences, real encounters, and they're illusory encounters. Here at McKenzie House is a self-described warlock. And you see him in this picture. You see that from his fingertips appears to be emanating a sort of mist, a kind of ghostly mist. And this was taken to be evidence, photographic evidence for a ghost and it's widely circulated. It's no such thing. We can actually analyze this photo and see these very black shadows and very bright glare on the woodwork and know that this was a flash picture. And all that's happening here, the, this is the sum total of this, is the flash is simply bouncing off these white sheets of paper and washing out an area of the photograph. So it has nothing to do with the ghost except it was in a place with someone who would interpret it that way. In fact, speaking of ghost photographs, you should know that the very earliest experimental photographs showed no ghosts. The earliest commercial photographs, the daguerreotypes, there were no ghosts. Everybody here, I'm sure, has heard of tintypes. There were no ghosts. Not until the early 18, about 1860, when glass plate negatives made double exposures possible, the ghost took the opportunity to appear. And a Boston photographer named William Mumler. Mumler was a spiritualist and a photographer, and he accidentally discovered while recycling some of his glass plates that if you didn't clean the emulsion off with a past image, you'd have a residual picture of somebody. And when you reused it, you'd get an extra in the background. And he saw how he could use that. And it was Mumler, for example, who produced pictures of Mary Todd Lincoln with Abraham Lincoln martyred, murdered, assassinated over her shoulder, behind her. Uh, Mumler was uh, exposed when someone recognized that some of his extras in his spirit pictures were still living Bostonians. <laughs> and he was criminally charged. What about this picture? 
Notice the strange white shape, the loop-like shape down the side of the picture. I had never seen anything like this when it was shown to me. Here's another example. I had a, a young mother called me, and she was concerned about ghosts. And I said, well, now, I, I said, Have you, are you seeing ghosts? No, she said, but when we take pictures, we're getting these just really strange white shapes. Um, I didn't know what, at that time, this was many years ago, and this was not well known. And I asked her to come in and bring all of her pictures and her negatives and her camera, everything. And so in comes the little children and the husband and the, and the mother. And I looked at those pictures and I did not know what caused it. I had not seen it before. It's now rather well known. But I did pick up her camera and notice the loop on the wrist strap. And she saw quickly where I was going with that, and she said, I, I don't think I got that in front of the camera. And I said, well, even if you did, that doesn't explain this. Because this is a black wristband, and these are very white shapes. But leave everything with me, and I'll see what I can do. And, of course, I took lots of pictures, and none of them looked like this. They were all gray or black until I had the flash on. And Bingo. And I think I've got another one. And you see this, um, do you see this sort of spiraling effect here? And this has been called a vortex effect and so forth. It's just the, just the braiding of the cord. But um, so I, I made some pictures and I called her back and uh, I just laid them out in front of her. And she said, that's it, that's it. What is that? And I explained it to her, and she said, I feel so silly. And I said, no, no, not, not for you to feel silly. Why are you supposed to know what caused this effect? I didn't know, and I'm supposed to know. So anyway, make a long story short, she was very happy. She was satisfied with that explanation. I've found since then, of course, as I found at McKenzie House, I need to tell you one more thing about McKenzie House. When I went next door, uh, to, uh, I found the caretaker next door, and I found that he had been chuckling to himself for about all these 10 years. <laughs> and I asked him, why didn't you come forward? He had figured out what was probably happening, you know, reading the newspapers. And he said, well, he didn't think it was his business to rain on other people's parades, but that he had said to himself that if anybody came and asked him, he would, he would tell them what he thought. And I said, so I'm the first one? And he said, yep. You're the first one. And I thought right then and there, I thought, this is what you do. This, this is it. You go to the haunted place or wherever. You go there. You collect the evidence. You figure it out. And when you do, people will believe you and they will love you for it. <laughs> well, it didn't exactly work out that way. But this lady, this lady was, uh, uh, believe me. Because I could, I could produce the pictures, and she was, she was not wedded to her belief. Now, you couldn't fake evidence like this, could you? These are uh, pictures of spirit guides. Uh, in a seance in the 1980s in Lexington, Kentucky, people uh, brought in a spiritualist from the notorious Camp Chesterfield in Indiana. They uh, sat in a, a seance circle. Uh, the medium showed a bottle of ink which he opened and put on the table. They, he showed a bunch of blank swatches of cloth about this big. He told people that he gave them the claws, these blank claws passed them out. And in the dark, the spirits were going to come after suitable invocation of the spirits. And people might feel tugging on their cloth or something, but, uh, and he came around with a red light and you could see some of the pictures beginning to kind of develop in the dark and uh, the spirits were taking ink out of the bottle and using that to produce their own self-portraits. And a young lady got suspicious later and she went around and was having trouble getting anyone to pay any attention to her but finally I think an educational television center to me said I would know what to do 
I, I had her prepare an affidavit and give me custody of her picture, and um, I uh, enlisted my forensic friend, John Fisher, and we began to study these. Um, can you see that um, these have shadows uh, and look for all the world like ordinary photographs with directional light source? Do you see that? Do, do these not look to you like, shall we say, pictures from newspapers or magazines? Would you agree? Um, interesting that in the spirit realm, um, they're still wearing uh, eyeglasses and earrings. Who knew? Who knew? It was news to me. Uh, background areas, like from a picture, didn't make any real sense if these were somehow um, spirit pictures. And so we examined the picture. These, uh, this swatch. They're called spirit precipitations on silk, even if it isn't real silk, even if it isn't really precipitated, and even if it isn't really spirits. It's called that. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> and this is, this is my friend John Fisher in a forensic laboratory, and he's using, we tried uh, ultraviolet, it didn't do anything. We tried infrared, didn't show anything, but then we used argon laser light and argon laser light was very helpful, and it showed, I don't know if you can see this very well, but can you see a sort of a, a solvent ring? Everybody see that? And we had a recipe from the book Psychic Mafia. And we knew from that book that you could use a solvent and a hot iron or burnishing with a spoon, and you could transfer pictures from newspapers or magazines onto swatches of cloth. And of course, you need two, two groups of these swatches, a blank set that you're going to show, and then the ones you're actually going to pass out in the dark. You were probably thinking that there was some chemical and it developed, right? Because yeah, skeptics think too complicatedly. And this is one of the great challenges of my life was to think more and more slowly, jump to fewer and fewer conclusions, don't be quick thinkers. I have, I have skeptic friends who are so quick they know what I'm about to say, except sometimes I don't say that. And uh, we're looking for the simplest solution. It's often much simpler than you've been led to believe. And in this case, uh, we were able to show that this was printer's ink, for example, and not ink that would have been in a bottle, and so on. We got uh, police warrants uh, for this particular medium. Um, we got police warrants on charges of uh, theft by deception. And uh, part of my evidence was to use these other spirit pictures. These are also spirit precipitations on silk, except, of course, they're ones I made. And yes, that's a picture of Pat Sajak. So we, we got, we got, <clears throat> we got warrants uh, for him, but we couldn't extradite him because we had him only on misdemeanor charges, not on felony charges, even though he made about $800 back when that was actually worth something. Um, but we could, you can't add up lots of misdemeanors to equal a felony. You can only get, you know, multiple, multiple uh, misdemeanor charges. That medium has since died, and I would like us here and now just to have a moment of si That's long enough. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, feel free to vent your, your emotions here. <clears throat> um, yes, this is the notorious John Edward. Uh, I worked with uh, Dateline NBC. They asked, they called me and said, uh, what did I think about John Edward? And I, I told them I couldn't tell you. It wouldn't be polite. I, don't, I told them what I thought, and then they... they um, uh, were willing to work with me anyway, and I said, well, here's what you do. Don't let him mill about with your test group, because he's going to talk to their dead, you know, spirit guides and so forth. Just don't let him do that. He can, he can actually do a very good job without that method, which is known as hot reading. He can, he's very good at cold reading, and that's just beginning to say things, fish for information. So I'm getting, for example, right back here, I'm getting a father-like figure who's passed over. I'm getting a J-sounding name. Does somebody here have a father-like figure? Not necessarily a father, but someone like that with a J-sounding name. Okay, here. Yeah. You noticed I was really pointing right just a little over here. It was exactly right. Very good. 
and um, was passed over and um, um, died of something, I, I don't know, something to do with this, maybe this area? Could it be? <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> most, most people don't die of the little finger. I've, I've found that out. So uh, they, uh, they did. They kept, they kept John Edward from the, uh, from the audience. And turns out, uh, when they did their the reading, he began talking about, he, he did a few, few little things, and then at some point he began talking about someone named Anthony. That's very specific for him. He does this sometimes. Anthony, and Anthony had passed over, and there was something to do with when Anthony was lying in the coffin, and something about a ring. This is starting to get kind of specific and nobody's saying anything. And then it turns out that one of the Dateline cameramen is, is choked up with emotion and is waving like this. He's clearly, clearly it's hit a nerve because his dead father, Anthony, they put a ring on his finger in the coffin or took off a ring, I forget. Astonishing. Until we learned out by refreshing his memory that while Dateline had kept Edward from the test subjects, he had been with the cameramen all day filming B-roll shots. And that in fact the cameraman had told this story and then kind of forgotten it. And so John Hockenberry interviewed John Edward on camera and was ready for him and he he said, he said, isn't it true that you knew that going into this reading? And you watch John Edwards squirm a little bit, and, and Hockenberry's very scathing. And he said, isn't it true that, that you pretended, you waited on this knowledge and waited until you could pretend it, you know, and Edward tried to worm out of it. He said, no, no, but, but, but you had that knowledge and you held it, and then you pretended like you just got it. As, isn't that true and so forth and Edward's glib and he tries to weasel out of it and in his book Crossing Over if you turn over somewhere towards the back you'll find me mentioned and John Hockenberry and Dateline and our organization then called PSYCOP now CSI and he refers to our gotcha moment and I like to say that's right John we got you we caught you cheating so enough about him I could, I could say more, but none of it would be pleasant. I mentioned Camp Chesterfield as being where that phony spiritualist with the spirit precipitations hailed from. And I decided to go there. Now, there's a book called Psychic Mafia, which uh, has the um, formulas for, for various things. It's by, written by a confessed medium. And he... Um, he explains how he fooled people for all these years and then reformed. And uh, he wrote this book. And I, I urge you, his name is M. Lamar Keene. If you can find it, it's out of print. If you can find that book, Psychic Mafia, even, even if the chapter has been torn out of it, the chapter called Sex in the Seance Room, uh, even if it's been torn out of the book, still you want to buy that book because it's still a, a useful book for you. Uh, but... Um, <clears throat> of course, if you can get it, you know, an, an abridged copy, all the better. Um, and in there, he tells about all the tricks and so forth. And, and there were various exposés at Camp Chesterfield, but none recent. So I decided I would go there and see what I could find out. And I decided to, I shaved off my mustache. I had just done the John Edward thing, so I was afraid I'd be noticed. So I took off my mustache and put on those, uh, that horrible outfit and, and I limped painfully into Camp Chesterfield and I told anyone who would listen about, about the death of my mother from Alzheimer's and, and how grief stricken and guilt ridden I was and I made everyone listen to that in great detail. Anyone who would, for a moment, give me a moment, I would just tell them this story. And then I went to a reading at the camp where when you go into the church, they hand out little uh, slips of paper that read as follows. 
think you can, you can read that. It's, it, basically, you're to write the names of some people who passed over and a question. So I wrote, I, I went, by the way, as Jim Collins. Jim Collins. So I wrote some names, and I wrote the question, <clears throat> Mother, will you be with me always? And they began to, uh, we were asked to, to fold them just in half, fold the slip of paper exactly in half. I was, the lady told me, if you fold it any other way, they won't read it. Uh, being a magician, I know several ways to do billet reading, and I was pretty sure right away I knew what was going on here. If you were to fold yours into a triangle, and you folded yours, pleated it, and you folded yours into a little square, and so forth, you could have some individualization. You might know if they were holding yours up. They don't want you to know that. They want them all to look alike, and they want them to be easy to open with just this move. Because when one is taken out and held up here, yours will be looked at down here. You see how that works? So he begins to say, he says, and I'm sitting in the back of the theater, back of the church, excuse me, and um, he says, I have a message for the Collins family. <laughs> here, here, I said, me, me. Begins to read off names. Yes, yes. And then he said, and your mother? Oh, yes, yes. People were crying for their reading, so you could see why this would be very, a very moving experience. And he said, your mother wants you to know she'll always be there for you. And personally, I tell you, it really was very moving for me until I remembered that at that time, my mother was still living and wasn't named Mrs. Collins. And I felt so much better. <laughs> because I'd caught another charlatan and I wrote an expose in Skeptical Inquirer magazine, probably made possible in part by your donations. And a couple of the psychics were thrown off the grounds, apparently. Uh, we take our small victories where we can get them. And now I turn to Another subject dear to me, Lake Munster Mysteries, I mentioned earlier. Um, let's go to Lake Okanagan, British Columbia. I went there with National Geographic. National Geographic is a pleasure to work with. They were uh, able to provide us with a seaplane to fly over Lake Okanagan. Uh, they were able to provide a large boat, a crew, a crew for side scanning sonar, a diving crew. I mean, they even paid my bar tab, which, as you can imagine, was considerable. <laughs> so, what were people reporting? For years, they reported, and I'm, I mean sincere, serious, good observers in many cases, reporting this long necked, multi humped creature. And we think science doesn't know of such a creature. Swimming in this undulating fashion, 30 feet long. Uh, I, this same kind of uh, creature reported at uh, Lake Champlain, uh, Lake Memphremagog in Quebec, um, uh, Lake Crescent in Newfoundland. And I've talked to people at these different sites. There's no question in my mind that the people are seeing this. These are, these are credible people and they are seeing something like this. I'm going to give you right here today, I'm going to tell you the scientific name of this creature. It's Lantra canadensis. But first, we looked at Rattlesnake Island, where this creature is supposed to inhabit, and uh, we couldn't find anything. We did side scanning sonar. Which I mentioned, we sent down a diving crew at Rattlesnake Island. But here's a quick glimpse. See it? See it? See it? Lantra canadensis. 
the Northern River Otter. And your quick skeptical minds, I read minds, by the way. I'm a former mentalist. I knew you were going to laugh at that, too. Um, but your quick minds are saying to yourselves, wait a minute, uh, that creature isn't that big. No, one isn't. But see, they play a little game. It's called, in, in otter talk, uh, follow the leader. And it may be mom and some pups, or it may just be some playful otters. And they're swimming like this in unison. And of course, if they were right under you, you'd recognize them as otters. Or if somebody even suggested, look, there's three somethings. But if you're programmed to think of a Loch Ness monster, and that's the large European otter, Luter Luter, is responsible for many of those sightings. I did a study in which I uh, took uh, the lakes and rivers in just North America that were inhabited by similar creatures and then overlaid onto that otter population. Almost perfect correlation. And yet, of course, I'm accused of saying, oh, he explains all lake monsters away as, as otters. I do no such thing. Some are beavers. <laughs> some are some are sturgeon, some are are uh, bobbing logs, some are, are outright hoaxes and so forth. But there you have it. And, and again, uh, I got onto this because I'd read about something like this in the 1930s, and then I then I met a wildlife expert in in uh, upstate New York who had actually seen this effect on on a man-made lake. He saw, hiding in a duck blind near, near dusk, and he saw this huge serpentine creature come out of the water. And it was incredible what he saw. And then he re recognized it for what it was. What an illusion. And I know a skeptic, a real skeptic, a subscriber to our work, and he saw, looking up from a cliff out into Kebra Bay, looking at, at the Kebrasaurus monster, and he saw it, even though he's a skeptic, and there it was swimming, this undulating serpentine creature. My goodness, how long and big it was. And it swam up on shore, and it morphed into one, two, three, or so otters. It was magical. So let us not be too quick to laugh. That's a little oversimplified, but you get the idea. I always wanted to put a cartoon here. I have the last one saying, next time I get to be in front. <laughs> okay, let's turn to Roswell, New Mexico, where in 1947, something crashed on Mac Brazel's ranch. And they said it was a flying saucer or a flying disc. And then uh, we were told, oh, it was, no such, it was no such thing. It was just a weather balloon. Well, folks, it wasn't a weather balloon. Shall I tell you what it was? Well, this was one of the nation's secrets. It was a secret United States government spy balloon from Project Mogul. Now all of you will have to be killed. <laughs> no, wait a minute. I, I had permission to tell you that. <clears throat> because a weather balloon and a spy balloon uh, look alike. It's just what's in the instrument package. Otherwise, they're a, a train of balloons I'll show you in a moment. But we were sending up these balloons with an instrument hoping to record the sonic booms of Soviet nuclear tests. It didn't work very well. This is before satellites. Didn't work very well. And the United States lost one of its mogul arrays in the direction of the Brazel Ranch. Now, you, can, you don't have to trust me. You can go and read the Roswell Daily Record, where Mac Brazel came into town and told people that the wreckage he found was foiled paper sticks, tape, and rubber. Does this sound like an extraterrestrial craft to you? Or does it sound like some kind of balloon with box kite type sticks and, and foiled paper? 
Well, we have pictures. Of course, the conspiracy theorists say they've been switched. But why say so? Because before any of this ever amounted to anything, Rancher Brazel just came into town and told what he'd seen before anybody could have gotten to him or hushed him up or bought him off or threatened him. And here you can see the sticks and, and tape and foiled paper. Uh, for Discovery Channel, I helped recreate a uh, mogul array, and we sent it up and then shot, had a rifleman shoot it down. Not scientifically important to have a rifleman shoot it down, but it's just great television. <laughs> <clears throat> and we showed what, what the effect might have looked like. Now, over the years, there have been all kinds of uh, follow-ups, including the alien autopsy film, which shows, of course, um, a typical, stereotypical alien. Now, this is the kind of alien that appears to people when they have those waking dreams I told you about earlier. They're apt to see a uh, little big-eyed, big-headed humanoid. Uh, this is my alien timeline, now rather famous, been published, published many times. It's been on television, in books, and so forth. But you can see that uh, we have many ways of imagining extraterrestrials, including Venusian-type creatures, little, uh, little green men, then Venusian-type creatures, Flatwoods monster, hairy dwarfs, goblins, blob, uh, cyclopean figure, mothman, and so forth. And then, in 1961, you get the, the uh, Betty and Barney Hill uh, abduction case, and you get the little big-eyed model. And from then on, you get a, another variety, but that figure comes back and back and back until eventually that's the official model. You go into a toy store now, and you can see that that's what the aliens officially look like. There's about 100 from my collection. I quit collecting, there were so many. The one on the bottom came out of a Carnival Sideshow exhibit where they were showing Roswell aliens. But we tend to create images, of, we tend to create our monsters in our image, many of them. Think about it. Uh, Bigfoot is our stupid cousin from the past. E.T., a futuristic version of us, come back. So here we are on this lonely little endangered planet, and these beings are, the messages often are messages for us to save our planet. Angels, of course, are us with wings. Um, vampires are us with an attitude. <laughs> I got a laugh that time out of that joke. It doesn't always happen. Well, are extraterrestrials visiting the planet Earth? Uh, not that I can find. But uh, people are being abducted nonetheless, they say. I was on um, a show once. Of course, you couldn't fake a picture like this. Here I am, and I'm the alien in... Uh, their context on Mars, believe it or not. Uh, but I was on John Hockenberry's show, TV show once, and uh, we were debating some of the alien gurus like Whitley Strieber and so forth, and uh, Hockenberry, uh, I, I was saying things like, well, alien abduction is just the yellow, it's hypnosis in the yellow brick road to fantasy land, or people are having these waking dreams, and I was explaining them. And he says, well, Joe gets the last word. Do you have any advice for us? And in one of those moments of inspiration, I said, well, John, just keep being skeptical. They aren't abducting skeptics. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. I better uh, move along here a little faster. I lost time at the beginning, but I guess I, I'm supposed to make it up somehow. Uh, crop circles. Uh, here I am doing field research. <laughs> See, they'll turn on you just like that, DJ. They'll turn on you. <laughs> Yeah, just when you think you've got them, you know, yeah. Uh, but uh, crop circles, I did an iconographic study. Crop circles started as simple swirl circles, then they became circles with rings, rings with satellites, uh, more complicated uh, each year, large uh, pictographs. Uh, they, some became eventually rectilinear and so forth. They were changing and changing and changing, suggesting that along with the fact that they occurred mostly at night, uh, in out-of-the-way places, they didn't like to be seen, uh, and so on. There's several clues that they were a man-made phenomenon, and we were just ready to go to press and skeptical inquire saying that, 
from a long study that I had done uh, when uh, a couple of guys uh, came forward and confessed that they had, uh, they had made these um, crop circles. Some of them are quite um, attractive and they're impressive, but a lot of people are amazed. Oh, you couldn't make, I say, have you tried to make one? Well, no. Let me just tell you this. If you can take a, on a sheet of paper an ordinary drawing compass that will make a circle or an arc and a straight edge, you, and you can make a design like this, which is easily done in geometry class, if you can do, draw that on paper, I can go out and make it in a field hugely. It's just not as difficult as you imagine. This is my favorite, <laughs> my personal favorite. This one I know is a fake. It, was, it appeared in the field next to the one that was made for the movie Signs. And here are the crop circle makers. <laughs> a motley crew of skeptics. Okay, related, one more, one more case. Um, I'm uh, moving along as fastly as I can. Now, how am I doing for time? I, I, I want to have time for some questions. Five or ten minutes? Okay. <clears throat> Everybody awake? Okay. Yeah, when they boo and hiss at you, you can tell. Yeah, okay. Then they turn on you just like that. So this is, uh, this is one of my favorite projects. Um, we, we go now to Peru, to the giant plain of Nazca, where across 30 miles of desert pampas, uh, there are lines and arabesques and drawings of... Uh, figures such as birds and spiders and other totemic figures so large they're best visible at about a thousand feet from an airplane. Now they've given rise to books by Eric Von Daniken and others, his book Chariots of the Gods, suggesting that um, ancient, maybe particularly non-white people, uh, were not able to make things like pyramids and stone figures on Easter Island and so, so forth. Um, and must have had guidance from extraterrestrials who were hovering over and giving them directions for making these large figures and so forth. I decided to uh, do some work. Now here's a schematic. Let me call your attention to this giant condor, which you'll see again in a moment. Um, 440 feet long. Think a football field and a half. It is huge. When you see these on the ground, it's hard to make out what they are because you, you need some perspective to get the whole figure, uh, though that's been exaggerated by believers. Uh, look also at this spider, and I'll come back to these pictures in a moment. I decided to make the giant condor. I'm not going to go into detail here, but basically I'm using a pair of cross sticks to sight with, and I'm using two sets of knotted cord to measure with. And we used a, about a six-foot uh, model. There's evidence that the Nazcas maybe began with a small drawing and then mocked it up. But we used no surveying equipment, no measurement of angles, nothing that was complicated. And I was able to produce this picture. Now, when I show you this, um, it's, the picture is high contrasted and it looks very blotchy. It looks like rugged ground. The ground is as flat as a pancake. You can see it here. But it has these dark areas in it and even rather whitish areas uh, because it's a landfill area. So some of it's white clay, some of it's black shale or coal and so forth all mixed together. When we high contrast that so that it'll show up well in a photograph, it looks a little, a little odd. But this is my drawing, uh, very similar to the one you saw. This appeared in um, Arthur C. Clarke's book. Here I am on the ground for perspective in the giant one of the claws. And then here's the actual Nazca spider. National Geographic begged me to come out of retirement. I'm one of the world's only Nazca geoglyph recreators. Uh, I've heard of maybe one other team that made part of one or something. I may be, maybe there are more than I know of, but um, they wanted me to make one for them. And I said, please don't make me do that. I'm getting older and it's a lot of hard work. And, it took a crew of us, you know, a couple of days and blah, 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 and so forth. And they said, oh, please, we want you to make us the spider. And I thought quickly, remember how much smaller it was than the condor? And I thought, well, okay, all right, I said, but you'll owe me. 
And there I am in my spider recreation film from, they were filming from one of those uh, cherry pickers. There he is, ladies and gentlemen, Spider-Man. <laughs> okay, let me go back to the pictures of the Nazca ones and just, because people are always wondering, well, but, 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 but why did they make them? And I had, a, I had a couple of observations that I had made, others have made. Uh, these drawings are all made with a single continuous line, sort of like the giant pencil goes down the drawing board and then it never lifts until it gets back to the beginning. Whereas the real Nazca drawings on their pottery and so forth, uh, it's like you draw a head, lift your pen, draw a wing, lift your pen and so forth, or your brush. But these are made with a continuous line. And I thought early on, years ago when I made the condor, I thought that they were just, um, this was just, they were connecting the dots as they went, as they plotted points. They were just connecting them as they went. Makes perfect sense. There was another factor, and I had no explanation for it. Notice that at the leg of the spider are two extraneous lines. The base of the tail of the monkey, two extraneous lines, and so forth. I had no explanation for that, and there were some far-fetched explanations. But now, this, and this is the consensus, I think, and I, I believe this completely. Let me point out, if you were to walk into one of these lines, and they're made by clearing gravel, sort of like a path, about this wide. That's what the lines, so the light earth shows up against the dark reddish gravel. If you were to walk one of these lines, you will traverse the entire figure, maze-like, and come out the other one. And I can think of no other reason for those lines other than entrance and exit. And you put those two features together and we're now reasonably sure that these were ritual walking paths by the Nazca culture. For what? Mm, to invoke the powers of, the, of magic and so forth, probably over the thing they were desperate for, which is water. But that's speculation, we don't really know. Oh, I meant to ask if anybody was bothered by gruesome pictures. This is what's left of Dr. Bentley. Uh, Cowdersport, Pennsylvania, 1966. And um, he supposedly died by spontaneous human combustion. Here's traces of, uh, from another fire of Mary Reeser in St. Petersburg, Florida, 1951. And uh, here's another one. Now, um, we're told that spontaneous human combustion can exist as far as science is concerned. The body's mostly water. There's no mechanism that will do it. And yet, people are, are reporting, uh, and, and there, there's no doubt that they happened, these mysterious burning deaths in which there's no apparent source of the ignition, the body is burned very thoroughly, and nearby objects are not damaged. But just to give you a quick, Mary Reeser was last seen wearing flammable night clothes. She was smoking a cigarette. She'd taken two second all sleeping tablets. And you have to ferret out this information. This information was hard to get. It was not in the books promoting this, this phenomenon. And obviously her body fat, she was a plump woman, uh, your body fat can melt and be absorbed into clothing or stuffing of a chair, fueling still more fire to burn still more. It's called, and it used to be almost just a hypothesis in the forensic literature called the wick effect. But uh, John D. Hahn, who published uh, some of our research uh, in a book, uh, Arson Investigator Manual, um, uh, decided to test this out and he's shown with the carcass of a pig that the wick effect absolutely works. I'm gonna let you quickly solve this one. What happened? Any source for the ignition? Fireplace. Notice the shoe missing. Uh, could she have tripped or was she trying to stand on one leg, fixing a shoe on, something like that? Uh, falls, hits her head, sparks shower out onto the body. The wick effect works over a few hours period. Notice this. A grate is displaced, proving a, that the body fell and knocked the grate aside. So where is the great mystery here? See how easy some of these are to solve? Others took us, we spent two and a half years on 30 historical cases. And I'm almost done here. I uh, just wanted to show you this, um, these miracles. This is a miracle claim of um, statues with heartbeats. 
uh, it turned out that people reaching up and probably just feeling the pulse in their own thumb, uh, rosaries turning to gold, the, the silver plating is being rubbed off is all that's happening, and the, and the brass is showing through. Uh, no real miracle in these. I'm sorry to go so fast. Golden door photographs that believers believe shows the doorway to heaven. You point your camera to the sun and take a picture, and out comes this doorway effect. It's very astonishing, and there's no trickery involved. It's the first time I saw this. Very eye-catching. Uh, some of them are quite beautiful pictures, but I call your attention to the Polaroid one-step camera, which has that shape as its lens aperture, and so it isn't the doorway to heaven. It's the doorway into the camera. And uh, here I am looking at that weeping icon in, in uh, Toronto, and I uh, thought this guy looked familiar. He had a weeping icon in, in Queens, New York, and had been defrocked in Athens for working in a brothel. So that turned out to be a fake. Here I am with the um, police detective on the left, and the, the woman is an attorney for the parent church. And finally, a word from our sponsor. And I'm going to close with this. The movie The Reaping, two or three years ago with Hilary Swank, uh, was based on my work as a miracles investigator. And they, uh, uh, they bought several copies of my book. I talked to scriptwriter. Warner Brothers had me down on the set. I got to meet Hilary Swank, who, let me tell you, is a very engaging, very sharp young woman. Um, I just wanted to make this point. You'll see why she was chosen to play the part. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? <laughs>